Hey, welcome again to Faith Church. My name is Stephen. It's good to be with you today. If you have your Bible, and I hope that you do, turn to Mark chapter 9. We're going to pick up in verse 30 through 37 in just a minute. Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 30. We have in our culture today a goat problem. I'm so glad you asked. We have a goat problem. Now, at the risk of sounding like 100 years old, can you raise your hand if you know what the acronym GOAT stands for? The youths of today. Okay, cool. Hands down. Uh, Greatest of all time, right? Anybody my age and younger mistakenly thinks that other people other than Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player to ever live, right? We've got these debates on is it it Michael? Is it Kobe? Is it LeBron? I have a, if we're taking recommendations, I'd like to submit a nomination for you today. I've got a picture on the screen. Jack Sigma, anybody? The blonde bomber, somehow this white dude has a blonde jerry curl. I don't know how he did it, but that's awesome. He wasn't all that agile because he didn't need to. He patented the shot where he was just behind his head, and you couldn't even get to the ball. You just had to watch it go in the hoop. 1979 Seattle Supersonics, world champions. Can we get an NBA team back here, please? We're just going to ask for the Lord's help with this, right? Okay, so. Our problem is not that we have uh, wide-ranging opinions on who kind of the goat is. It's that we throw this term around too loosely. Anytime anybody does anything nice, we go, oh, that person's the goat. They're the goat. Uh, if, if everybody and everyone can't be the greatest, everybody can't be first place, everybody cannot be uh, a winner, In today's passage, the disciples are having this same argument. Who is the greatest? And when they zig, Jesus zags. Mark chapter 9, verse 30. We'll read about eight verses here and then share a prayer together. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know. For he, Jesus, was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. And they came then to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child And put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Let's open our time together in prayer. Fathers, we open up our our, our Bibles together today. I pray that our lives would be open to your word to the teaching, to the authority that you have. And Jesus, just as you sat down in this position of authority and taught your disciples, you do much the same things with us today. Through the power of your word and the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, would you teach us today to be more like you, to serve more like you, to walk more closely with you. God, we're delighted to get to see on stage today a visual representation of what you're trying to teach us. The path to greatness is often found in receiving children unto you. We ask for your help in all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, today is a Sunday where there's lots going on, and this is a passage that I want to preach like four sermons on, so I'm going to condense all of those into an abbreviated time uh, together today. But if God's word never gets you excited, there's something wrong with you, Uh, and so ask for God's help in that. But today's the day that gets me really excited for God's word, starting here in verse 30. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. So Jesus is moving south with his disciples down the Sea of Galilee. They've left Mount Hermon where the transfiguration has happened, and they're moving south for the very last time on the Sea of Galilee. 
They're passing through Galilee for the very last time. Jesus is about to fix his eyes and set his final journey towards Jerusalem. And then you see in verse 34 down there, he went to Capernaum. This is a home base of ministry for him. Every place Jesus is in today's passage, he's there for the last time. There's some finality there that should cause us to lean forward a bit in our chairs. Look at the back end of verse 30. He didn't want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples. Don't you love the graciousness of our teacher Jesus? He he doesn't want the crowd to know, not because he's tired and weary, because he needs a break from them. Don't you love that Jesus never needs a break from you? Jesus doesn't need an introverted break from saving you, from being king over your life, from loving you and me. Jesus never gets bored with you. He never gets fed up with you. There's not this other group of his people he needs to go to to vent about you. Jesus is always on, always for You and me. He's getting away from the crowd because these disciples whom he has chosen, whom he loves, still don't quite get it. And Jesus knows his days and weeks and months are coming to an end on earth. And he is insistent with these slow spiritual learners. Aren't you glad that they understand who he is and why he came? And so he pulls them aside. And for the second in three times here in Mark uh, 8, 9, and 10, Jesus makes his abundantly clear prediction on what he's going to do. Look here at verse 31. The Son of Man, that's Jesus, this messianic title from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. Every now and then, my wife sends me to the grocery store, which is like 60% of the time is a mistake. I've had my Costco privileges revoked in our house because of overspending, but like, don't, you never know what you need until you see it there. And you're like, oh, they fit my needs before I even was aware of them. But she'll send me this very detailed, like, like one thing to get on my way home from work sometimes, and I will get the thing next to the thing I was supposed to get, because most of the words were the same, or the dosage, or the amount, or the ingredient. It was close, but it wasn't there. And her instructions were abundantly clear. I just was off in la-la land, right? Uh, Did you misunderstand anything Jesus said here? The Son of Man, look in verse 31, is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Okay, that kind of sounds weird. We'll talk about that in a minute. But what does that mean? Jesus clarifies, they will kill him. You know what kill means in Greek? Kill, okay. (laughs) I checked it just for you this week, okay? And when he's killed, after three days, he will rise. Now, we have the questions on his three days, 72 hours, or is it kind of this Jewish idea of days, meaning Friday's a day, Saturday's a day, Sunday's a day. It's not that complicated to understand. Like, nothing that Jesus said should be all that difficult for them to crack this code of what his plans are for the next few days and weeks and months together. But Jesus, again, is patient with these guys. Which is great, because I don't know about you, but my faith life frequently lacks the type of courage that Peter, even in his arrogant, sort of foolhardy way, exhibits. Peter gets out of the boat. I like being in the boat. He steps a few steps and sinks, and I'd be the guy being like, can you believe Peter started sinking? What a lack of faith that guy had while in the boat safe. (laughs) I'd be the guy going to wake up Jesus and be like, hey, there's a storm. Don't you care? Aren't you awake? Aren't you paying attention? I know my faith is fickle, and I think yours is as well, more often than we might like to admit. But Jesus is clear, and these disciples don't understand. And all three of these predictions of the passion of Jesus, uh, it's followed by the disciples being confused. And three times Jesus explains them, the Bible says boldly and, and plainly, and they don't understand. And Jesus is faithful to walk alongside them. And there's this clever little wordplay happening here in verse 31. It says, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Uh, Mark is written for a largely Gentile, kind of Greco-Roman audience. They might have missed this allusion back to Daniel chapter 7, which is this messianic title for whenever Messiah comes, he will refer to himself as the Son of Man, this representative of all people. And so they might have missed it, but you and I shouldn't. And so Jesus is, again, connecting himself to the Messiah that was promised. He's claiming to be God here in as many words. But the Son of Man will be betrayed or turned over uh, to, by, to the hands of men, killed by the hands of men. Notice what's happening here. The creator of all men is being betrayed, handed over to men who he created to kill him. It kind of begs the question, last passion prediction, Jesus essentially kind of blames his crucifixion on the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, and that's right too. But then Jesus expands our understanding of the gospel and says, now the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men. 
And that's not just Rome. That's not just Pilate or, or Caiaphas or the Roman centurion, who's kind of the hero in the Gospel of Mark at the end. Spoiler alert. Uh, but, but it's not just the people who literally do. It's, it's, it's me. When you read that, the Son of Man is to be delivered over into the hands of men, you should go the hands of Stephen. Uh, the hands of me, the hands of you. Like it's our sin that held him there. And if you speed past that, you're going to miss it. Verse 32, but they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Uh, can you shoot a hand up if you've ever not understood something in the Bible? Just me? Okay, good. Uh, this is a near universal experience for Jesus' followers. For 2,000 years, uh, even before that, when people followed the one true God and Yahweh while they were awaiting Jesus to show up, misunderstanding God, even with this high view of his word, is pretty common. As the Old Testament is forming and becoming canonized, these scribes that were trained to be professional copiers, as they, I don't know why I'm writing left-handed, I'm not left-handed, but, but as they came to a passage they didn't understand, there was actually this gift from the temple, uh, this ritual where they would write something, and they would read like in Judges when Jephthah sacrifices his daughter because of this sort of uh, promise gone wrong. They'd go, what the heck is going on there? We can talk about that later. But they would come across a story or a teaching that didn't make sense. These scribes had this ritual given. They would, they would get up from the table, go back to this basin of water that was just for this purpose. They would wash their hands. And as they're washing, they're praying, God, I don't understand this. I don't understand this story, but I'm going to commit to not fixing it, to not adjusting it, to not softening it, to not kind of cleaning it up. And as you walk, look through the, the scrolls that we have, all these examples of books preserved, there is nothing that's been preserved more faithfully from antiquity than the scriptures. Not Homer, not the Iliad, not the Odyssey, not Shakespeare. The Bible stands just empirically above all of them as far as translation faithfulness. And I think in part it's because God gave this gift to them, a, a process of prayer when you don't understand. But notice what happens when they don't understand. They're led into fear, and that should not be normative. Can you raise a hand if you're brave enough to admit you've ever been fearful to approach Jesus? Maybe there's been a thing you're like, I, I want to love him, but not if he's going to call me to go to the other side of the world. I want to love him, but not if he's going to ask for a complete reign and rule over my life. I want to love Jesus if I can love him on my terms and not his, except is that the way that this works? No. And so again, likely that feeling of fear towards Jesus, towards actually giving our whole life to him, to surrendering our whole life, to putting our full weight and trust on him is also likely universal and fairly normative in the church, but it shouldn't be. It's okay to not understand God's word. It's not okay to be led into fear. So why were the disciples afraid? They could see Jesus. They knew what color eyes he had. How he liked to trim his beard. What, how long he would wear a tunic before he felt, this doesn't pass the sniff test. i got to get a new one. Like They knew all the things that you want to know about Jesus. They knew these things and were still afraid. I think maybe they had this misunderstanding of who and what the Messiah was. Imagine if you thought Jesus, as Messiah, was supposed to be this military conquering hero who's going to slay his enemies and put his people on top as he continues to teach you and you continue to misunderstand, I would wonder, man, am I one of the enemies? <laughs> like, like, I'm excited for Jesus to conquer all the people that I want him to conquer, but what if maybe he has a different agenda than mine? And of course, we know that understanding of Messiah is incorrect, but if you had that idea, I can see how you'd get there. But maybe they're starting to get a glimpse of who Jesus actually is. Maybe they're starting to connect the dots of, man, Jesus is this sovereign king that has been promised since Moses, since David. Everything prior to this has been leading to this moment. Maybe this actually is God in the flesh, and he gets to tell us what to do. He gets to go die for us. He gets to give us the thing that we can't give to ourselves, which means he gets to lead you and me. He gets to reign and rule over you and me, and maybe that should cause in us a healthy amount of fear and awe before a God like that. But they get stuck in fear. Verse 33. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? You think Jesus ever asked questions he doesn't know the answer to? No. Uh, parents that were on stage, you probably already have this like Jedi mind, especially mama trick, uh, where you can know that your kids did something. My mom's here today. She would do this thing growing up. She would say, hey, uh, anything you want to tell me? And she would start tapping this foot right here. And I'd be cycling through my head. And I think I've told you this before, but I'd be okay, she knows something. 
She can't know everything. I do too much stuff, right? And so I got to give her something. It's got to be like enough to get punished for, but can't be like all the things because that'd be disastrous if I actually was held accountable for all the things that I did. And it turns out I don't think she knew anything ever, but she knew I was guilty because when you got guilt and shame, you kind of walk around and it's this visible thing. Jesus says, hey, what were you guys talking about? They were like, nothing. Verse 34, they couldn't even say that. They kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. When we approach Jesus, we approach a person, not principles. We approach a ruler, not rules. We approach a king, not commands. Faith in Christ is about literally following Jesus, not just getting this list of things to do and to not do. And so it's hard when we kind of turn away from that relationship. I love getting to officiate weddings. And as I stand with a couple, um, they, like like me and like you, if you're married, uh, they don't know what they're talking about, do they, when they're up there on that platform, on that stage, saying these vows. They don't know what they mean, but they're saying it because somebody like me tells them to say it. And and they they like this person a whole lot. And I'm not sure everyone means a whole lot more than that. Uh, But what they, that I do turns into I will, doesn't it? it? It's okay if on your wedding day, you don't fully grasp the gravity of what's happening as long as you know that person, you know that relationship, you love that person, you're wholly committed to Jesus and wholly committed to them. You can make that marriage work. So when we follow Jesus, we're just following a a person, but these disciples buy into fear and silence and arguing about who the greatest is in this hierarchy of needs here. Flip one page over to Mark chapter 10 if you have a real Bible with you. I didn't say anything, it's fine. Mark chapter 10, verse 42, similar passage here. Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. And this is one of the greatest clauses in the whole New Testament. But it shall not be so among you. Same words here. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. And I love that Jesus never tells you me to do something for us that he hasn't done first or on our behalf or more. Verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Flip back to Mark chapter 9 here. I love that when Jesus is essentially asked to boil down what, it, what his mission statement is, we know he gets this question of the greatest commandment, and he essentially says, love God and love people with everything you've got. But Jesus here marks his identity as you're supposed to be a servant of all. Uh, I love that there's not this prohibitive, hey, don't have sex outside of marriage. Okay, that is true. God teaches that clearly in his word. But when Jesus gets essentially one thing to say, he says, die to yourself and serve others. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, when I first moved here last year, we had uh, some lunches with like just some Boeing guys, right? And, we'd, and talking about their life and their work, like, oh yeah, they rattled off these acronyms and I nodded and pretended like I knew what you were talking about. And they said, well, I started off as a C4 and I go, mm, C4, okay, good, good. And they said, then I got promoted to a purple two. I was like, ooh, that's good, purple two. That's a good, that's a good color, good number. And they said, I'm hoping to retire as like a tiger nine or five. I'm like, that's the best one. If I was going to pick an animal level to be at, it would be tiger nine. Like, this is normal for us in our society, right, to have these levels of classification, right? Like you're at this level, so you make this much and you matter this much. And then if you work hard, you stay long, you get to go up here and you get to do this and this. And what Jesus is saying is the church is the one place that does not happen. He's not trying to change the way Boeing works. Maybe he should, I don't know. But what Jesus is saying is the church should be this beacon of counterculture ways that we interact with one another. I had the seminary professor one of my first days, I walked into class late, uh, which was been fine, except he was already yelling at somebody else. And I was like, ooh, he's yelling at him, and he was here before me. Uh, but uh, my, my seminary was, was pretty casual, um, and uh, uncomfortably so, right? And so instead of being like Dr. Smith, you'd be like, hey, just call me Miles. And so I had a professor, uh, Roger Olson, okay? And so Dr. Olson was very adamant, right? So he did not buy into this casual kind of atmosphere, and he was like, I am Dr. Olson, and you will, this was the speech, right? You will call me. He's a little bitty dude. You will call me that, right? And he's berating this guy that's almost as tall as me. And I'm late. I'm thinking, I just got to duck down here and get to my seat right before he starts yelling at me. But I was at a church event with Dr. Olson like the next week. And same thing. I walk in, he's yelling at somebody. I'm like, this guy just yells all the time. Uh, maybe he had like little man syndrome. I don't know. But he was yelling at somebody else because somebody else had called him Dr. Olson at church. 
And he said, hey, here, I'm, I'm Roger. You can call me Raj. I'm like, I'm never going to call you Raj. <laughs> but his point was, hey, out there in the world, it's normal and maybe even right to have these different levels of ways we interact with one another. But in the church, everybody is on equal footing before the cross. Right? And so the idea that somebody would insist on a title or a way of treatment or a seat or a ministry kind of program or whatever uh, shows this heart that's not yet in tune with Christ, the servant of all, the slave of all. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. Plato once wrote, how can man be happy if he has someone to serve? How can man be happy? This is the Greco thought at the time. How can man be happy if he has someone to serve? And then Jesus says, true greatness is found in serving people that can't serve you back. And nobody's greater than Jesus. If you write down one thing today, that's what I want you to write down. True greatness is found in serving people who can't serve you back. And nobody's greater than Jesus. It's no mistake that Jesus uses a child for this object lesson. It's not that he looks around and goes, okay, what sort of things are at my disposal? And picks a kid. It's very intentional. We'll explain why here in just a minute. Verse 35. Jesus sat down and called the 12 to himself. Anytime a rabbi in Jewish culture sits down, that's like our version of standing up, right? Like you listen to him. He's in teaching posture now. He says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. I wish Jesus would pull a Dr. Olson and drop the hammer on somebody here. The disciples just lied to him. They were just arguing about who was the greatest and Jesus doesn't correct them, doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't even push on their idea, their desire to be great because Jesus knows he gave that to them. Do you want to live a great life? Maybe a a more Christian way to kind of ask that is, do you want to live a legacy? Do you want to live a life of significance? That's the desire for greatness. God gave you that. He gave it to you and to me. And like so many good gifts God gives us, we twist it and distort it into something selfish and us focused instead of using it for his glory and his purposes. Jesus says you must be a servant of all. In Greek, that's diakonos. That's where we get this title of a deacon. I think one of the reasons many churches like ours has moved away from a formal deacon board is the the word deacon literally means table waiter. It doesn't mean 30 bosses of a church, right? I don't know about you, but I've been in churches where the deacons are like the elders. They're, they're, they're assuming an authority that biblically is not theirs to have. And more than it being an office in the church, it's a role for all of us to step into. Jesus doesn't say a deacon of some. He says a deacon of all, a servant of all, a slave of all. Verse 36. And he took a child, put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me but him who sent me. Um, Have you seen those uh, calendars where, what's it called, where the babies are like in kale and stuff? And Gettys, where they put them on the vegetables and cornucopias of fruit and whatnot, right? And you can buy this camera of all these like naked babies and on top of all these little fruit baskets. I don't, it's this weird obsession our culture have, or we, especially in like modern Western culture. We've sort of uh, elevated kids and babies and cuteness and innocence almost to this idol level status. None of that was happening in this culture. So when Jesus picks a kid, he's picking a kid that may not make it to the next birthday because the infant mortality rate was so high. He's picking a kid that's probably not old enough yet to work, to earn their way. He's just another needy, complainy, mouth to feed. Parents, can I get an amen? Okay, good. None of y'all took the bite. I'll let you know what second service does. Kids are not valued in this society. Kids are on the same level as like handicapped people. Uh, People that have some sort of chronic illness that need to be treated as other, whereas the church comes in and and counterculturally treats these people with dignity and respect, just as if they are created in the image of God, just the same as all of us are. So Jesus takes this kid, and don't you love that Jesus doesn't just point to him? He doesn't just say, hey, like a child, our Jesus is the kind of Savior that gets up close. He doesn't stay in the crowd. He picks up this child, hugs him, and puts him in his lap. And it says this in verse 37, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. This child is a perfect example of the lowest of the low in that culture at that time. That sounds weird to us, especially on Child Dedication Sunday, doesn't it? Uh, But it's true. Jesus often is busy loving the least while you and I are arguing about who is the most. 
Jesus is active at work doing his thing, and one of his things is loving the least. And then you and I, in sin and flesh and pride and arrogance, do our thing, which is arguing sometimes about who the most is. In verse 37, there's this promise, hey, if you receive me, it's not, Jesus is not saying here, be like this child. He's saying, be like me. The message from this passage, Jesus teaches this elsewhere, but this passage is not teaching, have this innocent childlike faith. Jesus is saying, be like me and receive the unwanted. Receive the people that can't help you. Don't you love serving people that are just a notch above you in the corporate ladder? When your boss asks you to do a favor, aren't you quick to jump to say yes than when like an intern does? If we're honest, a little bit of that is present in in all of us. We want to be seen. We want to be recognized. We want to be praised. And Jesus says, man, I've got something way better and different from all of you. And notice what you get if you receive a child like that. If you serve people that can't serve you back, you get Jesus. And you don't just get Jesus, you get the Father who sent him. The whole access to the Godhead, they're now empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And the implication is pretty clear that if you don't receive a child like that, if you don't serve others in this way, you, you should question if you actually know the King of Servants anyway. And so I'm not saying if you don't serve in kids of faith, you're going to hell. Kind of. I'm just kidding. But if your heart has this posture where it's always saying no, saying no to needs, no to next steps, no to what God has in front of you. It's not my business to say if you're in or out. That's one of the biggest lessons from the Gospel of Mark is this dichotomy of who we think are insiders or who are outsiders. But you should question, man, do I actually know the Savior, the servant of all? Because what Jesus teaches in this passage and so many others is there is a path to true greatness, your desire and mine. To be great, to live a life of significance, to pass on a legacy to the next generation is a good gift given to us by our creator. But the path to true greatness is down, not up. And man, who goes lower than Jesus? Who has descended more than heaven to earth? Who's died a worse death than Jesus? Who has got exalted higher than Jesus, the name above every name, so that at that name every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father who sent him? That's the kind of God we follow. That's the type of greatness you and I can live. And if you choose to live an earthly level of greatness, we'll do your funeral here and people will say nice things about you. And in a generation or two, you'll be forgotten. And there won't be an eternal impact to your life here. But with Jesus, you can live a truly great life. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful that you invite us into uh, service and that you talk about service not as a project, not as a time stamp sort of ordeal, but a life trajectory of making a spiritual difference in the life of other people. God, that you call us to receive children, to serve people who can't serve us back, who can't sort of further our stock in or outside of the church. And so, God, would you just forgive us when we are all too like our spiritual forefathers, these first disciples, comparing ourselves to our left and to our right, arguing about who the greatest is instead of recognizing that you, Jesus, are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You have no rival and we serve you together. And Jesus, we are keenly aware that now you no longer just call us servants, although that would be more than we could ever deserve or desire from you. But as we looked at last week as we celebrated communion together, you, Jesus, now call us friends. And so help us embody the path to true greatness by serving down, not trying to get up a ladder that we would serve and welcome and receive, knowing that in doing so, we're following you more closely. And Jesus, if today somebody needs to give their life to you for the very first time to see the extents that nobody's gone lower than you, nobody served more than you, nobody died worse than you did, and nobody was raised to life more victorious than you do, I pray that as we close our service with this final song of response, they would have the courage to get up from wherever they are in the worship center today. And to make their way back to the back of the room and be able to talk to a prayer partner about how to walk through giving their life to you. God, we've talked about with child dedication how we are an actual church family here together. And so if there are needs in the body that we need prayer over, I pray that we would have the courage to go back and seek prayer from people that are eager to give it. God, would you be honored as we continue in worship this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.